Hi, Joel. But you know, there are all types of myths out there about food. And people don't know how to eat. It's amazing. They don't know how to eat, basically. You know, like we have the people believe in the high protein diet, low people who believe in low protein, people believe in high fat, others people low fat, high carbohydrate, low carbohydrate. People are arguing about some percent of macronutrients and they're, and they're trying to test these diets, high in fat, low in fat, high in carbohydrate, and they're missing the whole point. They all miss the whole point. There's a broad assortment of ratio, macronutrient ratios that could be acceptable, but they're missing the point that it's the quality of your diet and the total micronutrient completeness of your diet. You want to have nutrient adequacy and nutrient and comprehensive exposure to thousands of nutrients that benefit humans. It's not about, their focus is on the wrong syllable, if you know what I mean. Joel, Joel what? Welcome back to the Longevity Deprocess channel. Today, we will learn from Dr. Joel Foreman is not just any physician, he's a pioneering figure in the field of nutritional medicine, a best-selling author, and a passionate advocate for using food as medicine. Over the years, he has helped countless individuals transform their health through his nutritarian approach, which emphasizes the importance of eating nutrient-dense, plant-rich foods to prevent and reverse disease and cancer. In this video, we're diving deep into the world of G-Bombs, a nutritional powerhouse concept developed by the esteemed Dr. Joel Foreman. G-Bombs is an acronym for a variety of foods that are some of the most nutrient-dense and health-promoting on the planet. According to Dr. Foreman, incorporating G-Bombs into your daily diet is one of the most effective ways to boost your immune system, fight off chronic diseases like cancer, heart disease and diabetes and maintain overall well-being. Dr. Foreman's nutritarian diet with G-bombs at its core is designed not only to help you lose weight and feel better, but also to protect you from serious health issues in the long term. By focusing on these nutrient-rich foods, you can take control of your health, enjoy delicious meals, and experience the profound benefits that come from nourishing your body with the best nature has tea. Oh, offer. Oh, a quick favor. We'd greatly appreciate it if you can subscribe and like. This helps the YouTube algorithm recognize the value of our content and share it more widely. In today's video, we'll explore the science behind each of these foods, discuss how they can be easily incorporated into your daily meals, and share tips on how to make the most of the G-Bombs concept. Whether you're new to Dr. Foreman's teachings or a longtime follower of the Nutritarian lifestyle, this deep dive into G-Bombs will give you valuable insights and practical advice to help you live a healthier, more vibrant life. Let's get started on this journey to better health with the incredible benefits of G-Bombs. Oh. So anyway, I want to focus today on some... on. Eating right, yes, but to realize that this is all about eating foods that are nutrient-rich, that have features that benefit humans. Like a panda bear is designed for certain types of foods, right? They're designed to eat, you know, bamboo shoots, whatever foods they eat, and, you know, alligators have certain foods they like to eat. And, um, and humans have certain foods that are best adapted to our biological structure that, make, that really give us magnificent good health. And I use the term G-bombs. G-B-O-M-B-S, because I want an acronym that people can remember really easily, to know that to, to write on the tip of their, their tongue the foods they're supposed to be trying to eat regularly every day if possible. So let's go over what G-bombs are, okay? So that stands for greens, obviously, for G and greens. B, beans. O for onions. M for mushrooms. B for berries, and S for seeds. Now here's the point. Every one of these foods individually has powerful immune-boosting anti-cancer effects. They're flooded with phytochemicals that fight disease. And we're going to look at some studies on each particular food individually. But let me ask you a question. What if we combined all the anti-cancer foods into a portfolio of foods that you use in your diet and to make your dishes and your cooking and your meal planning every day. Well, that's the key to really winning the war on cancer in America. 
It's not just living on a diet of all of berries or eating, 42, or eating three big bowls of mushrooms a day. It's not really focusing on one food and just eating that food. It's getting a broad assortment of these beneficial superfoods in your diet on a regular basis. That's the key because they work synergistically. Dr. Foreman will now tell us more about the first group of foods. So let's look at green vegetables for a minute because there's one particular phytochemical in green vegetables I want people to know about. And I, want, I think it's really important that you know this because I feel that nutrition should be taught all through elementary school continuously. Not a course, but something you take like reading, writing, arithmetic, and nutrition all through, your, all the, through the whole <laughs> educational process. Because what's more important than what impacts how long you're going to live and the quality of your life and whether you get depressed or whether you get to order an autoimmune condition or develop psoriasis or lupus or kidney failure or brain damage or, or you know, what's, what's more important than actually your health? Why shouldn't we learn about this? But anyway, so one thing I want you to learn about, an important term, is ITCs, standing for isothiocyanides. It's one of the most powerful anti-cancer phytochemicals in natural plant foods. And there's, you know, there's a lot of different types of ITCs. There's about 100 different types. But they come from green vegetables. Special, specifically the cruciferous green vegetables. And the word cruciferous is that family, like the broccoli family. And it's called cruciferous because the flower is shaped like a cross. But they all, all these vegetables, like Brussels sprouts and bok choy and cabbage and broccoli and broccoli robin, you know, and um, watercress, arugula, you know, all these vegetables are, the ITCs are not in the vegetable yet. What's in the vegetable are glucosinolates in the center of the cell, of the plant cell, that gets converted into ITCs as you chew the vegetable in your mouth. And the better you chew the vegetable in your mouth, the more cells you break open and the more ITCs are formed. And it's important to know this because it really helps you remember to chew your salad really well when you're eating it. It helps you to chew your vegetables better. If you don't know this, you could not realize that, you have to, that you're not going to produce a lot of these anti-cancer compounds if you eat the salad without chewing it well. A lot of people do. They probably, don't get, they probably lose 90% of the potential nutrients there because they didn't chew it well enough. So there's, a, there's an enzyme in the cell wall of the vegetable in a little package called myrosinase. And the myrosinase enzyme, when you chew the vegetable well, it releases it and it mixes with the glucosinolate in the center of the vegetable with the center of the cell in your mouth, producing the ITCs in your mouth. There's other interactions that take place in these, with these compounds in between the mouth and the saliva and the bacteria in the saliva that produces nitric oxide and other beneficial compounds as well. So the good things happen in the chewing process. Are you following that? Now, it's also important to note that that myrosinase compound is heat sensitive. And that if I took the broccoli or the cabbage and I cooked it well and then ate it, I would have deactivated the myrosinase enzyme. So then when you chewed the cabbage or the cooked kale or the cooked broccoli, you wouldn't produce as much isothiocyanide had you eaten that same food raw because the myrosinase compound is easily deactivated. The doctor will now describe how we should prepare greens to get the most nutrients out of them. So it's important to chew, chop, and blend, or to really blend, break these compounds up while they're still raw. For example, um, in my book, Eat to Live, which I first wrote and published, I think, in 2004, I had a description on how to make an anti-cancer soup. And I wrote down in the book, you know, juice of five mega carrots and put the juice in the soup and cut up your mushrooms and throw zucchini in there and onion and leeks and kale and, and mustard greens and collards, you know, all these healthy foods in the soup. And I said, when the zucchini and the onion and the kale got soft and mushy, take it out with the tongs and put it into the Vitamix machine or the blender and blend it down so it's smooth and creamy with a few cashew nuts and then pour it back into the base of the soup so the mushrooms stay lumpy and chunky and the beans are lumpy and chunky but the greens and the onion are smooth and creamy to give the food a nice, you know, a, a nice texture. But now I don't tell people to make the soup that way because now I'm more aware of the need to retain the nutrients, the powerful anti-cancer effect of the onion and the greens that are, that are those compounds that are lowered by cooking. So what would I do differently today? to magnify the anti-cancer potential of the soup. What would I, how would I make that soup differently than I did years ago? Could I do anything to change it around, to make it better? What do you think? Right, you, right. So what this, um, what this lady just said, she correctly said that, that the ITCs 
in green vegetables and the organosulfide compounds in onions and leeks that are so important against cancer are not destroyed by heat. They're heat, they're heat stable when they're water cooked in a soup or a stew because the water prevents them from burning and the water limits the temperature from going above 100 degrees Celsius. So in other, case, in other words, these ITCs are not destroyed by cooking in the soup. But the soup heat would have destroyed them from being formed. So what she said was, you take the onion and the leek, what's raw, and the kale, the mustard greens raw, and put it in the blender and blend it while it's raw. And maybe a ladle, ladle a little liquid in there so it blends better, just enough to blend it up well. But don't add so much liquid that you dilute the chemical reaction too much. And you'll create this like smelly chemistry set in your kitchen. Yeah. And then you can take that slurry that you just made and put it into the soup to cook because you would have maxly formed those compounds first and while they're still raw, and now you can cook it and heat the soup and you can cook the beans and cook the mushrooms and things like that. Are you following me? So that's, that just says chew, chop, blend, and eat a lot of green vegetables because the more green vegetables you eat, the longer you live. Here's a study on cruciferous vegetables, what we're talking about here, on over 100,000 people. And there was no tailing off in the benefits where longevity is concerned. What do I mean by tailing off or leveling off of the benefit? It means that there was a study, for example, on mushrooms that showed that women who had mushrooms on a regular daily basis, who ate 10 grams of mushrooms a day, which is about the size of your thumb, had a 64% lower risk of breast cancer, right? Now, that was on 10 grams of mushrooms. Now, what if you follow people who ate 20, 30, 40, 50 grams, 100 grams, 200 grams, 500 grams of mushrooms? Are you going to see cancer rates continue to decrease as you go up in a straight line? No, of course not. As you pass 20 to 30 grams of mushrooms, it levels off. Eating a tall bowl of mushrooms is not going to benefit you over eating a small half a cup. Did you follow that? But not with green vegetables, because green vegetables are an inherent basic food for all primates. And our body is designed to function on green vegetables. And in fact, the more green vegetables you eat, the longer you live. Matter of fact, I'm right here, I can't help myself. I'm going to have to eat this tile right here and <laughs> just go over here and stop the lecture and can eat that thing. <laughs> but the point is, is that we're, as an animal, as a species, we're designed inherently in our biological coding and the way our body, our immune system functions. Dr. Foreman will now give us the result of some of the studies about greens and disease. And, and actually, our immune system does function based on a lot of green vegetables. For example, the part of the cells, the DNA in every cell, has a section called the ARE, the antioxidant response element, which is fueled by a transcription protein called the NRF2 transcription protein. And that means that this transcription protein activates the part of the DNA that protects us. It keeps the cell clean, it repairs broken DNA crosslinks, it removes free radicals. It's our most active part of the DNA that protects us against disease. And that part is activated by green vegetables, by the, by the, isothi by the isothiocyanates, the ITCs and green vegetables, and other phytochemicals that we get from these colorful plants. In other words, we don't have a functioning immune system. You don't like green vegetables? Well, tough on you, you know. But of course, taste is learned and people, you know, and, and we develop a taste for things we get used to eating regularly. But so, and cruciferous vegetables have been tested with people with those genes, like for example, the GST1 gene for breast cancer. You know, people who are pro highly prone to breast cancer, those with those women are given green vegetables, the risk of breast cancer goes down by more than half. But they weren't given that much. And what if they were given the amount I recommend, which is much more than that, or given the other synergistic effects, the other beneficial effects, like from the other G-bombs? That was just, you know, that's pretty significant half just from having the green vegetables with no other changes. And people with the, oh, that was the BRCA1 gene, like the BRCA1 gene for breast cancer, and the GST1 gene for colon cancer also shows a reduction, a tremendous reduction in colon cancer from the consumption of green vegetables. I'm saying that green vegetables consumption in the highest tertiary or quartile is linked to dramatic reductions in almost all cancers that affect humans. And plenty of green vegetables. Cancer or no cancer. But it, it cures cancer. So now the doctor will explore the second food group. All right, let's go on to beans. Because beans are another superfood. 
And I love to talk about beans because beans are associated with long life and all, you know, all those blue zones, long lived populations. When we study elderly people all over the world, we find that the more beans they eat, the longer they live. Whoever eats the most beans lives the longest, just like green vegetables. They should be our major source of protein and our major source of carbohydrate because they're high in carbohydrate and protein, right? They're, they're carbohydrate rich and they're protein rich. They're a good, in other words, they have a lot of what we need to maintain our muscle mass, to maintain our strength, to maintain our energy. They're digested very slowly, so when you eat them, they last you for many hours and they prevent overeating because they're very filling. Now, beans have a compound called um, inositol pentakis phosphate, IP5, which is very powerful against cancer. It doesn't allow cancer cells to replicate. And they're also full of phytic acid and you know, these phytates that have anti powerful anti-cancer effects too. A lot of factors, and they're full of polyphenols and flavonoids as a whole. So beans have a, you know, the colorful beans, especially the red beans and the black beans, white beans, they have all these colors that are full of different phenols that give them that colorful, you know, the colorful you that make them so healthy. You know, you guys know that when you eat blueberries, those beneficial compounds that make the blueberries blue are so healthy for us in our brain. And when you eat blueberries, you don't urinate out the blue, do you? No, it doesn't turn your urine blue. You keep the color inside you. Those, when you eat a red bean, you don't urinate red, or you don't eat green vegetables, you don't urinate green. You keep a lot of those colors in you, and those polyphenols and stay, in your color, stay in your skin and color your skin. And they, and, those, and they protect you against skin cancer. But they don't just attract, they're not just attracted to the skin, they permeate every organ of your body, including your brain, and your liver, and your kidney, and your heart. These phytonutrients stay into your tissues. They live in your tissues. And they're active and they stay there for, you know, for years and months and, you know, they're important to be replenished and they're important to be high in our tissues. You can look at a person. I can look at a person and see how healthy they've been eating just by looking at the color of their skin. You notice how a lot of people you, um, will go to their doctor and the doctor will say, something wrong with you, your skin looks orange. And they'll put their hand out next to you and go, look at my fleshy pink color, you must, something, you know, my, your orange tinge, is something wrong with you? I have too much carotinemia in your skin? You're eating too much carrot juice? No, I don't eat carrot juice, I'm just, it's all the vegetables I eat, whatever. But the point is, you should say to your doctor who tells you that, that it's you who has the abnormal color to your skin. This is the way your skin should look. So this means I'm protected, and however, but you are not protected, and you're gonna be at high risk of early death, especially from cancer, from not having that color in your skin, because that shows you're not eating enough vegetables. Did you follow that? Just like you go to your doctor, not to diverge too much, but you go to your doctor and he tells you, your white blood cell count is too low. It's only 3.6, and it should be between five and 10. Maybe you have to go to the hematologist for them, one of those or an oncologist for those bone marrow biopsies, which is going to kill you, to check you don't have cancer because your low white blood cell counts. The facts are is that when you eat a healthy diet, like I recommend, it drops your white blood cell count low out of the normal range because low white blood cell counts are linked to people who live longer life and have lower cancer rates because when you're eating all the food, the immuno, this food that supports your immune system and, doesn't, and takes away inflammation, you don't need all those white blood cells floating around. There's not so much inflammation in your body. And you should say to your doctor, who doesn't know it better, it's not his fault, he never learned this stuff. He's trying his best. But you should say to your doctor, no, um, you know, Dr. Smith, it's you with the higher white blood cell count who's at risk of getting cancer. Myself with a lower white blood cell count, as Dr. Furman said, is, is the one protected against cancer. You are the one who needs the bone marrow biopsy. <laughs> So don't be confused about that. A low white blood cell count is a good sign, not a bad sign. You shouldn't be in the normal range where other Americans lie. You know, that's a sickly population. But in any case, inositol pentakis phosphate, you know that's powerful stuff because it's 26 letters long. It has to be. Here are some more benefits of eating beans. And, of course, people eat beans even just twice a week. There's a study on men who eat beans twice a week, drop their risk of colon cancer by half. Imagine if they eat beans every single day, right? You know what happens. No more friends left. <laughs> but they don't get cancer. But as you eat beans regularly, of course, your body builds up the bacteria it takes to digest them. And the gas problem goes away if you eat them regularly. Unfortunately, the gas problem goes away, but there's other fun things about beans. Now, see, if you eat, the studies show that if you eat beans, even two tablespoons a day, if you're giving them too much indigestion, start with smaller amounts, increase them over, gradually over months. So it can digest, you can build up the bacteria and the, and the digestive capacity to digest them better. 
right? But just two tablespoons a day decreases death rate by 8%. Imagine if you ate a cup and a half or two cups a day, you'd live forever. <laughs> so let's, so, but let's look at this for a minute because beans are the highest in fiber in most all foods. They're the highest in slowly digestible starches. That means when we're looking at carbohydrates and ranking carbohydrates on a hierarchical scale of ones that are lower glycemic to higher glycemic, we know that the slowly digestible fibers in beans, the slow digestible starches, excuse me, break down the glucose very, very slowly and feed carbohydrate into your body over many hours, fueling you for energy, allowing your body to burn it for energy as opposed to storing it, because it doesn't raise an insulin response and it keeps the glucagon at it working, so you can still burn fat at the same time you're burning the carbohydrate from bean, so you're gonna lose, maximally lose your weight, keep your glucose levels favorable, help reverse your diabetes, and they're full of something called resistant starch, which is almost like a fiber, because it's starch that is not digestible by the, by, we don't have the enzymes to digest it. So what happens to that resistant starch in the bean? It's degraded by bacteria. And after a while, we, and the more we eat beans regularly, the more we build up the bacteria to digest the resistant starch, and we convert that resistant starch into a fat, short, short chain fat, predominantly short chain fatty acids, predominantly the one that's called butyrate, and that butyrate, some of it gets absorbed, which has anti-diabetic effects and immune protective effects as well, and the butyrate and those fatty acids have an anti-inflammatory effect on the wall of the colon, preventing inflammation and reducing risk of getting hemorrhoids or constipation. But the point is, is that, you know, that's the, that's the disease called um, diverticulum or diverticulosis. Those little pockets from eating a low fiber, high meat diet. Oh my. Possibly. It's a long word. Here's some more of the health benefits of eating beans. And I've seen in my 25 years of medical practice, scoping people, putting scopes in people's rectums and looking up their um, colon to see what's in there. You know, and, and seeing that a lot of them have diverticulum, but, after, but they come back five years later or ten years later after following the program and eating better and the diverticulum are gone, disappeared. I learned that, I learned something by, able to, by scoping these people, that it actually, wa I was able to watch these diseased colons getting better because they were changing their diet, really exciting. But the resistant starch is something that's beneficial and, it, and because it's converted into the fat, the carbohydrates convert into fat, and it occurs so far down in the digestive process, 90% of those calories don't get absorbed into the body. Only 10% get absorbed. 90% of those calories go into the stool, increasing the fat in the toilet bowl. So part of the calories in beans are lost to the toilet bowl, and of course, lowering the glycemic effect of the beans even further, and the fact that the bacteria that the beans enable to grow, that they feel they're a prebiotic, Beans fuel the growth of an, and accelerate the growth of the healthy bacteria in, in your digestive tract. And those bacteria have beneficial effects, which slow the absorption of glucose from other foods that are not beans. So had I ate beans with a mango in the same meal, the glucose from the mango would be absorbed more slowly because I had beans in that meal. Did you follow that? Now, scientists call it the second meal effect because you have these bacteria that live in your digestive tract now all the time. And what you eat at the next meal is going to be slowed. The, gluc the glycemic load of that following meal after you ate the beans is going to be slowed because you eat beans regularly because of the bacteria that are now present in your, in your digestive tract all the time. But it's not just the second meal effect. The second meal effect is not a good name for it, even though that's what the scientists call it, because it's the third meal, fourth meal, or fifth meal. It doesn't matter when you eat the meals, right after or, or the next day or six meals later, you're still getting the benefit from those bean-based bean, ba bean bacteria growth. Did you follow that? So beans, if we look at the nutritional density of carbohydrate, if we look at the fiber, if we look at the resistant starch, if we look at the glycemic load, then we can rate carbohydrates on a hierarchical scale of quality, and then we see that the, the ones adding the starch and fiber gives us a good idea that these beans are the most beneficial when you have metabolic hindrance to weight loss, such as you know, obesity and diabetes, and you're a person genetically who's a difficult weight loser, then you want to especially eat less of the, those carbohydrate foods with a higher glycemic load and low fiber and eat more that are high in fiber, high in nutrients, more resistant starch and, you know, and, and lower glycemic, okay? So they're a superfood with powerful anti-cancer effects and, they, and, they, and they're also relatively inexpensive and make it easy for people to, you know, we should be giving away beans. 
Really? Really? Same effect cooked or raw? Well, you can't really eat beans raw. You have to soak them and cook them, unless you sprouted them. Yeah. But basically they should be... But so I'm an advocate of using cooked beans in your diet. Okay? Now for our next superfood with a quick yummy recipe. And onions are another superfood. You know, onions have been, you know, I didn't really used to like onions or know they were a superfood years ago. I didn't eat that many onions. But now I learned about their power to prevent cancer and I put them in, I put them in all my food, all like raw, I add them here, I add them there. Like for example, I'll make a cooked kale dish. I'll steam the kale and I'll, for just 10 minutes, I'll use the timer, I'll only steam it for 10 minutes. And I'll take it out with the tongs and put it in like a dish towel and fold the towel over to get a little water out. And then I'll take the towel away into the chopping bowl and I'll chop the kale, maybe with a cashew cream sauce I made with unsweetened soy milk and a little raw cashews and some toasted sesame seeds. Or I'll, you know, I'll put a little nutritional yeast or maybe a little roasted garlic in there. So I'll make a little cream sauce for the kale, chop it in there. I'll drizzle a little tomato sauce on top of it and then I'll sprinkle raw red onion all over it on top. Now, I, I, just, I like raw red onion on everything. I like the difference in flavors and the crunch from the raw red onion. I used to not even like that. But now that I know it's... But now I've been use, eating it more over these last 10 years or so, and now I really love raw onion. I like to put it on, on a lot of different foods. Because, because when it's raw, it has those beneficial compounds that, that um, benefit us. Now, I just ate that cooked kale just now, right? right? So did I not produce the isothiocyanides from the cooked kale? Because... I cooked it and, and weakened or inactivated the myrosinase compound. What do you think? They get any benefit? What are the, they get the full benefit from the kale? I particularly paid attention to eat some raw watercress, arugula, or, or some raw cruciferous vegetable on my salad at that meal so I'd have myrosinase enzyme present in the digestive tract when I was eating the cooked kale. So I got more benefit from the kale. So I'm, I'm, I'm very, uh, now, lately, you know, because of this new idea, these new um, studies in science on, on the heat sensitivity of these important enzymes, I make it, when I go to a salad bar, I make it, a, I pay particular attention to adding a little arugula to my salad, or adding some red cabbage to the salad, or adding a little baby kale to the salad, or adding, and I love the, like, the baby arugula and the baby kale, and I grow in my garden, you know, I'll grow, I'll plant, um, you know, I'll plant like baby cabbage or kale, or you know other types of um, like every two weeks I'll start a new new row and I'll eat from that row and I'll then two and then the next row will come up and eat from that row you know so I'm, I'm making I'm paying particular attention to make my salads to include not just lettuce but also the raw cruciferous and to chew them really well so I eat that with the meal I'm eating my cooked Brussels sprouts or my cooked kale or my cooked broccoli with so there's some myrosinase enzyme there to activate the conversion now you're following that. Mustard greens, mustard seed, whatever you want to use, but you should be aware of this so you're, doing, so you're maximally getting more nutritional bang for, your, for what you're eating. Does it matter how it's cooked? If I do like roasted kale chips, does that affect it? Like well, of course, the less you cook it, the better it's going to be, and the more you cook it, the worse it's going to be. So if you aren't going to dry out kale chips, then you want to make it as, you want to do as low temperature as possible and might nicely dehydrate them. Don't really use a dehydrator. If you're using your oven, put it on the lowest setting possible because the less you cook something, the more you're going to retain that, the enzymatic action. The more you cook it, especially roasting it and darkening it and blackening it, you don't want to like, don't cook at high temperatures and as lower the better, right? I can eat a raw onion without crying. Here are some more of the health benefits of onions. Now, onions have been in, shown in scientific studies to, to be protective against almost all types of cancers, between 50 to 88 percent reduction in the highest consumer of onions. And those consumer of onions were only eating a half a cup of onions in the highest quartile of consumption. They weren't eating that much onion. And likewise to the myrosinase enzyme in kale, myrosinase enzyme in all cruciferous vegetables, there's an enzyme called alienase in onion. Now, I know I spelled it wrong over and over again, but I got it spelled right on this slide. It has two L's and two I's. It's hard for me, it was hard for me to remember the two I's. And I used to, you know, so it's alienase. It has two I's in it. It's the only, one of the only words with two L's and two I's, right? So you can remember it now. Alienase. And you, and you want to remember to put raw onion on your salad. 
And if you need some cooked onion in the meal, then make sure you have some raw onion in the salad too to supply some of the alienase enzyme. But you know that onion is particularly protective. The, and now I want to have a salad bar because I know this now. I go to the salad bar and I put some of those little scallion, crunchy little pieces of scallion on top of the salad. I know how anti-cancer powerful it is to eat that raw. And I put some red onion on the salad and I'll chop the red onion up finely. I'll take the red onion and I'll chop it up with very thin slivers and, and put it on my salad. And really, I love the flavor of it now, especially when it's distributed very thinly dispersed as opposed to big thick chunks. You know, I like that flavor and I developed a taste for it because I've been doing it. The more you eat something, the more you develop a taste to want to prefer to eat it that way. So it has that heat, sure, sure, there are lots of other protective factors in onion, but those substances in onion, like the quercetin and the fructooligosaccharides and that's present in the onion family, have powerful prebiotic effects. They're like a probiotic, right? You don't need to take the probiotics because your body will naturally produce those beneficial bacteria. You don't have to eat the sauerkraut and the yogurt and the fermented foods because when you eat the raw vegetables, like the raw cruciferous, the cooked beans, the cooked mushrooms and the raw onion, your body naturally makes the right balance and of the beneficial bacteria that benefit your health. Did you follow that? You don't need to take it, it's there. Your bacteria is natural fermentation and bacteria growth that takes place. And these are powerful foods against cancer. Cancer killing foods. Now, the doctor will explore the fourth food group. Mushrooms. And what's more powerful than mushrooms? Mushrooms are not so high in micronutrients, they don't score high on my Andy score, but they have other salient features that make them very important anti-cancer effects. And some of those most important features that make these mushrooms work how, you know, in conjunction with our immune system is one is the fact that they're powerful angiogenesis inhibitors, right? Powerful angiogenesis inhibitors. The word angiogenesis is not the first book of the Bible, no. It's, what it is is, the word angio means blood vessel and genesis means to make, and the angiogenesis inhibitor means it doesn't allow the body to grow new blood vessels. Because when you eat a high glycemic diet or you eat a lot of meats and you eat a lot of foods that are growth promoting, because animal products promote growth hormone, like IGF-1 and, and, and high glycemic carbohydrates promote insulin, and they're both gonna, they both have promote angiogenesis. And they both promote the storage of fat. If you put, you know, the animal products with the processed carbohydrates together, high insulin and IGF-1 simultaneously, that's how you're going to produce the most fat growth possible, by mixing it together. High carbohydrate, refined carbohydrate with high meat. So it's like the hamburger, the hot dog, the macaroni and cheese, the pizza. That's the most dangerous things you can do is eat the average American diet. Those are angiogenesis promoters, and those, that means that allows, they promote fat growth, and fat cells secrete angiogenesis promoters too, and the fat needs to have new blood vessels bring oxygen to it to keep it alive, and more glucose and other nutrients to it to keep it growing. Without the new blood vessels, how does fat grow? It can't. You can't grow fat unless fat produces new blood vessels to fuel it. But mushrooms say, no way, Jose, I'm not letting you put fat on your body. When you eat mushrooms, it's difficult to store fat. When you eat mushrooms, it's difficult to have cancers grow and spread because for a cancer to replicate and grow, for a mass and a tumor to grow and replicate and to spread, it needs, it, part of the cancerous process is angiogenesis promotion that occurs from abnormal tissue and from cancerous cells that, are, that cancers get a whole huge blood vessel growth. Doctors recognize cancer by looking at blood vessel messaging. You know, where blood vessel is flowing increased in an area can make it light up to know it's got cancer there. So one of the hallmarks of cancer is that it's, a, it's tissue that's, has, that's angiogenesis promoting to allow, it's getting a blood supply and it's excessively growing. But mushrooms say, no way, Jose. I'm not letting you put, grow cancer. I'm not letting you, if you have cancer, I'm going to retard its growth and, and interfere it from spreading. So mushrooms have powerful angiogenesis inhibiting compounds, and believe it or not, they have powerful aromatase inhibitors too in mushrooms, natural aromatase inhibitors. You've heard of the drug tamoxifen or those kind of medications they give one with breast cancer because these drugs block the aromatase enzyme that produces estrogen. So it keeps women's estrogen levels lower so it don't, they don't stimulate the cancer to grow. Well, you know what? Mushrooms do that all the time. Before, now, you don't wait till you have cancer. They have a special affinity to breast tissue. 
to prevent breast tissue from being stimulated by estrogen, forcing or causing abnormal breast tissue growth. They allow normal growth and normal production of milk for the baby, and they allow normal growth of tissue during you know, development in teenage years, but they don't allow excessive growth of breast tissue. It's like magically designed to allow normalcy but not abnormalcy. Did you follow that? And there are patients who have breast cancer who can't tolerate tamoxifen or, because they get depressed from it, but they can tolerate mushrooms and mushroom extracts, and mushrooms contain a mild carcinogen called agaritine. And agaritine is blown off with just a few minutes of cooking, steaming, water walking, cooking in a soup. So it's actually better to eat mushrooms cooked than raw. Some foods are better raw, and some foods are better cooked. Green vegetables are probably better raw, right? Onions, better raw. Tomatoes uh, and mushrooms, better cooked. We'll talk about that as we go along. And mushrooms have antigen binding lectins. That's a fancy sounding name, but they're, they kind of work in a weird way. They actually stick to or adhere to cells that are abnormal to help the natural killer T cells recognize cells for attack and removal before they become cancerous, right? Mushrooms are an extra, it's like a third arm to the immune system. You know how some animals have a tail for balance or have wings for flying? Well, we have an immune system that has an extra arm, makes it super protected, and that's eating, that's using mushrooms. Super arm is the immune system for extra protection against disease. Now, the doctor will explore the fifth food group. Berries. Berries, and I include pomegranate in that category, for the bee are also powerful superfoods with anti-cancer effects. And they're full of those dark, you know, they've been shown in scientific studies to actually lower blood pressure and lower cholesterol and actually protect the brain against aging. And like beans, because you think that berries are sugary, they're sweet, but they have a very low glycemic effect and they actually interfere the pectins, the polyphenols, the fibers they contain, they interfere with the absorption of glucose. They even interfere with the absorption of glucose that, of other foods that are not berries. They're diabetic favorable. They're cancer, anti-cancer favorable. And they protect the brain, of course, and have powerful anti-cancer effects, shocking some of the scientists that are doing the studies. I think some of these scientists studying blackberries and strawberries and wild blueberries were kind of shocked themselves when they saw some of these early stage cancers reversing and coming back to normal. One study gave people with um, squamous cell carcinoma of their esophagus, it gave them 60 grams of a strawberry extract a day and the majority of people had regression of cellular proliferation and apoptosis and, re and, and reversal of the cancers without even eating a healthy diet, just with the strawberry extracts. We're talking here about these are powerful anti-cancer compounds. Cancer-killing berries. Here's the final food group. Seeds. <laughs> and S for seeds. Super powerful, effective seeds. And how many of you eat some flax seeds or chia seeds or sesame seeds every day? Raise your hand. Flax, chia, or sesame every day. Wow, a lot of you do. I guess you're a very educated audience. Well, here's the thing. In most people, most audiences I lecture to, very few of the audience raises their hand. When I ask audiences, I lecture all over the country in medical conferences and, and you know, medical and scientific meeting and, and um, in hospital meetings and things like that. And I mostly ask the crowd if they eat, f eat mushrooms and very, and very few of them eat mushrooms regularly. And I ask them if they eat flax seeds or chia seeds or sesame seeds and very few of them raise their hand they do that. And I say, well, how could you not do that? How come you don't know to do that? What if there was a, a drug that could do what these foods could do? People would be paying $500 a month or $1,000 a month for it. And these are almost free and you're not doing it? Why don't you know about this? Why isn't it the front page of New York Times? Why doesn't, the, why doesn't everybody know about this? How could you not know about these important um, scientific advances in nutritional science? How could you not know about this stuff? They'll learn about the latest drug really fast, right? So let's look at some of these studies on seeds for a minute. But before I do, I want you to recognize that the later in life we intervene with a positive food intervention, the less effect it's going to have. The earlier in life we start the intervention, the more effect it's going to have. If you're going to, you know, if you're going to eat salt, then it's going to have a more damaging effect if you're eating salt your whole life. 
high salt your whole life has a more damaging effect. If you just had salt, high salt for a week or two in your life, obviously the longer years you do it, the more it takes its toll, right? The more the cancer is advanced, the less likely eating mushrooms or flax seeds are going to facilitate a reversal. The earlier the pathology, the more effect you're going to have on seeing the benefits. Did you follow that? Max, when would maximum benefit occur in utilizing flax seeds anti-cancer effects, specifically its anti-breast cancer effects, at what period of time would those effects on protecting against cancer be maximized? What's that? Before you develop the cancer. And the earlier in life, the better. Maybe even in childhood start doing it. But certainly the effects are going to be much more beneficial if you start this intervention before you have a diagnosis of cancer. Because once you have a diagnosis of cancer, it's relatively advanced. You know, what, for example, that um, if you had a breast cancer diagnosed on a mammogram, that coalition um, coalesced cells, the amount of cells that have you know, been put together in a lump, to coalesce large enough, to be replicated enough so you and I can see it, it has to be there at least 10 years. You've had cancer for more than 10 years. By that time, the majority of those cells have spread outside of their original site and gone to other areas. That's why mammograms are not early detection. They're late detection. That's why the effects or the benefits are minimal to not at all because it's usually too late. So once you know you have cancer, that's relatively late to be intervening with flax seeds. If there was a, like a, a retirement conference going on and I you know, pulled somebody off the street here, you know, an elderly person, maybe a guy at the age of 70, and took out his prostate on the stage here, anesthetized him against his will and operated on him. I think I mentioned this earlier this week. Yeah, I did. I'm telling the same joke again. <laughs> okay. But anyway, so the point is, I took out his prostate, you'd find prostate cancer cells in almost all men over the age of 70, and the same thing if you looked at women's breasts and chopped them up and blended them in the Vitamix and looked on an electron microscope and posted on the, on the screen here. You'd see cancer cells in almost all women's breasts over the age of 70, you know. So I can assure you, running around, so the point is, is that don't wait till the mammogram shows you have advanced cancer. Do something now while you, before you have cancer, or even if you have an early stage cancer, that's when it's reversible. Spread the seed. Spread the seed. The doctor will now give us some results of the research on seeds. Okay, so that was the introduction to the seeds, and let's go now look at what the studies show. Because one study, let's look at one study. So one study, I'm going to start with, where they gave women, um, um, pardon me, don't look at that slide for a minute. Let me go back to this slide. Sorry about that. I want to just you focus on me for a minute, because I'm not doing this slide. Because this is a study which is a double-blinded controlled style, um, study, where the participants didn't know who was getting the muffin that had the flax seeds or not. The participants were just getting a muffin. They were still eating their standard American diet and one group got a muffin and the other group got the same tasting muffin but one had flax seeds and one didn't. And they didn't know which had which. And the doctors and pathologists reviewing the breast cancer, six weeks later they were biopsying their breasts women who had breast cancer already, and they did re biopsies of the cancer cells in the breast to see the difference in pathology six weeks later from the, eating the flaxseed muffin, and what do you think they found? Dramatic benefits. Six weeks with a flaxseed muffin, dramatic benefits. People already had a diagnosis of cancer. You saw apoptosis, death of cancer cells, just from the flax seeds, regression of the proliferatory um, signaling, in other words, the cells stopped replicating. You already showed, you know, doctors know that people that are, that women who are diagnosed with breast cancer, that a certain percent of them go on for the cancers to get worse, and a certain percent of them do go on for the cancers to get better and go in the opposite direction. Early stage cancer can be go back the other way with no dietary intervention, just because it just happens sometimes. But if you want to stack the odds in your favor of having the cancer grow the other direction, especially the earlier it is, then you do the right things. And having the lignans from flax seeds Stack it in your favor. Just the lignans from the flax seeds. That's just one intervention. Forget about the mushrooms and all the other things we're going to do, the green vegetables and the berries and all the other things that have powerful effects. But just the lignans from flax seeds show powerful effects. So now they did a 10-year study, right? Not a six-week study with a muffin. And now they track the amount of lignans women ate over the 10-year period. And these women were all diagnosed with breast cancer. They followed them for 10 years. 
And those in the highest quartile of, C, of lignin consumption had a 71% decreased mortality from breast cancer. That's huge. It's especially huge when you consider these people already had cancer, breast cancer, that's relatively advanced. Imagine how protective it would have been had they started taking it before they had a diagnosis of cancer. Or got cancer in the earlier stages, not after it was diagnosed in the late stages. You following that? All diagnosed cancer is in the late stages. All right, so look at the number here now. Look at that number in the highest quartile. A third of a milligram of lignin. That means these women ate uh, maybe a little bit of sesame seeds, a little bit of broccoli stems or pineapple, or a little bit of flax seeds, because they were only eating a third of a milligram of lignin. How, much, how many lignins are in a tablespoon of flax seed? Anybody know? Take a wild guess. 500. Good guess. It's about 21 milligrams of lignin in a tablespoon of flax. It's seven milligrams per teaspoon. And these women in the highest quartile of consumption were just eating a third of one milligram. They weren't eating a tenth of it. They're just eating a, hardly any lignans, and they saw this degree of protection. Do you, follow, do you get my point? What if they started it earlier in life? What if they took a reasonable amount of flaxseed or sesame seeds or, or chia seeds? Like, because the studies on men in prostate cancer show when you go from a teaspoon to a tablespoon, you see dramatically even more reductions in protection against prostate cancer. We'd expect the same thing to occur with women when they go from a teaspoon to a tablespoon, and here they weren't even consuming a tenth of a teaspoon. And they were doing it late in life. We're talking here that, about that these foods are pow have powerful protection. Food is our most powerful medicine. There's no medicines that can do what food can do, that can do this kind of stuff, without side effects. The only side effects are good things that are happening to you. Protects against heart attacks and strokes and dementia in the process. Sesame seeds along with the flax seeds are also a good source of lignans. Thanks for watching Longevity Deprocessed. Hit like, share, and subscribe to stay updated on evidence-based longevity tips. Share your thoughts in the comments, your journey matters. Remember, small daily habits create big changes. Until next time, keep deprocessing for a healthier, longer future. Let's make this journey together.